Okay, what's up everybody? Um, we went over last time uh, the main ideas of the first part of the lecture, which were, let's really quickly review them here. So um, Neville is setting up the, the, the foundation of him already have experienced, him already experiencing God. So that's how he feels qualified that it'll happen to everybody. That's how he feels qualified to tell that he'll, uh, that everybody else will experience God. Maybe the same way. Uh, uh, the Old Testament is a blueprint for the new. Um, awareness is God. Everybody has awareness of being themselves. So everybody has God in themselves. God is dreaming in uh, humanity right here. God is being in whom it awakes. Um, and then there'll be, yeah, more awakening. So, uh, okay. And then we're talking about the Bible passages that he quoted to uh, to support his statements. Um, I went over the uh, the the connection of the the shoot joining together of, of Galatians four and six into when the time had come God sent forth the spirit of son. So it's a little misleading the way that he said it in my opinion. Um, so we'll continue with that right in this. Okay, so uh, where are we? In the lecture, where in the, in the time had come, God sent forth the Spirit of the Son. Okay, so he's crying, Father, we don't hear it until the time had come. Uh, so this this is misleading, in, in my opinion. If you don't look it up, um, you can, uh, what, what Neville wants to communicate is that until the time has come, we're not going to realize that we are uh, the Father through the act of David calling us Father. Okay, so we're going to go over chapter is the Psalms, right? Okay. Um, okay, so Psalms 44. I don't think I linked that one. I'm going to link it. As a self. Okay, uh, let's look at Psalms 44. This is the context. This is the prayer for God to save uh, the one praying. So, um, I don't know who wrote the 44th chapter of Psalms. Um, David apparently wrote a lot of them, a lot of the Psalms. And a couple of other people wrote some other chapters. But this, this chapter, which the context of this one is, uh, rouse thyself by sleepest, O God, so God. Uh, it is God who sleeps in man. Okay, so he's, uh, he's, he's, he's supporting his, uh, his statement that God is sleeping in man. Uh, because of this 44 Psalm, which, um, let's see, you are my king. Oh my gosh, where is it? 44, what did I say? 44, 23. Okay. Okay, awake. Uh, why are you sleeping? Rise itself, don't reject us. And then, uh, why do you forget our, our affliction and oppression? So he's asking God for uh, deliverance. Okay, so redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. All right. So uh, the, wh whoever is writing the psalm is asking for help from God. And, uh, and he's taking this specific uh, sentence in, uh, in, in the 44th psalm to uh, support his idea that God is sleeping, I think. Okay, so, oh yeah, I've already, geez. All right, so... Okay, that's that's what I go. I think so. I think it was the first experience where uh, where the, I talked about in the last video. Dave's gonna call you dad. You're gonna sorry, I'm too flippant sometimes. Dave's gonna call you father. Um, you're gonna respond, and that's how you'll know you're my father. And blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this this is so cool. Uh, I was talking about here uh, the spirit being the remembrancer. I okay, the Holy Spirit being the remembrancer. This is uh, really cool. So I, I did some light Google searching and I found that uh, Bishop Woodford, um, it talks about the Holy Ghost being a remembrancer. Um, the Holy Ghost is, the Holy Spirit is, is in charge of making us remember a couple things. So in the lecture, it says that, let's see. Okay, so right here. It, it talks about up here, okay, the, the Holy Ghost is using the power of memory to check man's sin and to stir him to repentance. So that's, that's the result. The, the cause is 
how many a wayward boy weeps bitter tears, he recollects mother's grave, earnest longings for well-doing, um, prayers and warnings. Um, so this is going uh, up here, um, or, or it ties into what Bishop Woodford said, where he's, he says to train up a child in the way that he should go, and then when he's old, he'll not depart. So he's saying, um, I mean, I mean, anybody can relate to this, where where you just uh, you remember something, or you uh, you 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 come to some sort of realization, um, and you 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 change your life as a as a result of maybe uh, uh, an experience, like a formative experience where you learn. Um, so that that was that's what uh, this bishop is saying is uh, when he, when the Holy Ghost is using the power of memory to check man's in. Um, I, I can't I can't find any other reference to the Holy Ghost being a remembrancer. If somebody else wants to look up uh, and see if there's any other uh, any other references to to the Holy Spirit being a remembrancer, um, this is the the earliest one that I could find. So the the only one actually that I could find uh, apart from you know some some contemporary um, contemporary lectures. Man, where was this? I'm gonna get the I'm gonna get the year. Okay, so. Apparently, uh, Bishop Woodford was a 1800s preacher, churchman, a bishop, not a preacher, sorry. Okay, so there is that. Um, now, if this, if this source is to be believed, uh, it's, the, it's the biblical illustrator and has all these copyrights by Biblesoft Incorporated. So I think it's credible. You always have to be careful with where you get your sources on the, on the internet. Anyway, so that's the, the story behind this little tiny word, uh, remembrancer. Okay, but yeah, interesting stuff. Okay, uh, next is, let me make sure that I'm not going ahead of time. Okay, yeah, uh, so, so an easy way to remember it is, well, remember the remembrancer is to think of the Holy Spirit as an accountability ledger. Okay, what is this? John 14, what? Okay, okay, okay. so this is, this is this part of it. So let's go over to it. 14, 26 is, but the helper, the Holy Spirit will teach you many things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Okay, uh, the context of this reference with the Holy Spirit as a remembrance term is that let me see if I go over it here. Okay, so the, the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And uh, that's, that's the same name. Um, the, this things, so Jesus is, is talking to I think he's making a sermon. I think, he's, I think he's giving a message. So uh, he's talking about of all these things. The, all these things I spoke to you while I'm still with you, but the Holy Spirit will uh, help you remember the things that I'm teaching you. Not, not that. Uh... Okay. So, so he, I mean, the the correlation between what Bishop Woodford said and um, uh, John. I'm assuming John wrote this book. Correlation between what what the those three guys say is different. Um, Neville says that uh, the Holy Spirit is going to bring back the memory that you lost. So when memory returns, you'll know that you are the Father. So that's what Neville is saying that the the function of the Holy Spirit as a remembrancer is is to remind you that you're God the Father. But here. That's not the meaning that I interpret it as. I interpret it as, um, as, as what it literally says here, where Jesus is talking and he's saying that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Okay, nothing about a new identity, nothing about you realizing you're the Father. Um, so there's a little bit of a, of a deviation there in, in meaning. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, next, next, next. Okay, so does it go back? I think 
Okay, yeah, he does. So uh, Neville is this, he's just talking about the idea he's going on about the idea of the Holy Spirit reminding us that we're the Father. Okay, and uh, he says it's going to happen to every child born of woman. Every child born of woman is one of the speaker. Okay, okay. So um, yeah, so every everybody's alike, and so everybody's going to have that experience because the same son, which is which is David, who's David, is going to call everyone Father. Um, and there's only one God, one Father, one Son. So um, when he calls you Father, you'll know the memory will return. And he's called me Father, um, and you and I are one. So um, yeah, because we're all Father, we're all like we're all one. That's what Neville is saying here. Um, and he's 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 not he's saying this from from subjective experience. I want I want to make sure that everybody watching this video and uh, listening to his lectures or whatever. Um, say that unless he gives a, a different source, he is going off of his own subjective experience, um, which is not sound, objectively speaking, logically speaking, uh, to, to make a general statement based off of one, one event, then subjective. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong with memory. Uh, but let's continue here. So body, one spirit. Okay, so he says that when there's one everything here, right here, there's one one body, one faith, one spirit, one one identity. Um, and so he says he he says right after that that's the mystery of scripture. Um, scripture is not secular history. It's it's salvation history. It's like metaphorical. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with history as the world teaches it. So let's go to Ephesians 4. So what's what's verse was it? Ephesians 4. Okay, right. One body, one spirit, even as you are called in the hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of this gift of Christ. So the context here, do I say what the context is? Okay, Paul's is telling this to the Ephesians. And then he's, uh, uh, Neville actually says that that's what scripture is about. Okay, so uh, Paul's telling, I therefore beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation that you are called. So because of the, the, the job that you're called to do, um, this is how you are to act. Um, there is there's, there's one, one identity, one body, one spirit, one, one everything. And so every one of us is given grace. Therefore, okay, all right. Well, that's, that's the, the main idea as far as uh, this, this one, oneness is concerned. All right, so you and I are experiencing history. Okay, uh, so he goes on to talk about himself here. Um, he's struggled just like everybody else. The day is coming where um, you know everyone will realize that they're God the Father. They'll all have that, that experience. Okay, and then so he's he's talking about why Judeo Christian is is hyphenated is because of the the Old Testament the Jewish tradition and text is um, is the foundation and the the precursor to the New Testament, which is the Christian. I mean, I think, I think that's what he's saying here. So it just goes on here. Um, ah, okay, right. So he quoted here one of them. The sentence reads, well, the context, they're expecting some being to come from without and save them, but he comes as one unknown. Yet one in the most ineffable mystery. Do I define ineffable? No, I don't. I think ineffable means um, unexplainable. To make sure. Okay, too great or too extreme. I was a little off. Sorry, to be to be described. So that's that's what that means. One of the most like crazy mysteries to let's let the individual to whom he experienced who he is. Okay, and then he quotes uh, the 44th Psalm again. All right, cool. So let's press on. Um, I, I searched up one unknown and I couldn't find anything about it, except for the a hymn where they talk about the, where they where they reference that that phrase. 
Okay, now anybody really familiar with Neville knows what he's talking about here. Um, he's being the sort of series referencing again, um, because that chapter of John, where anybody in the tomb is, uh, is going to be called forth, and the tomb is the skull, is your, your, your skull, wonderful skull. <laughs> um, so uh, that's where you'll ra raise from. And so the voice is the vibration that's going to be in tune with you. And I think that I think he's he's bringing up the the picture of the, the mental image of of a tuning fork because I think I think in in his own experience he said that he you'll you'll experience a great vibration like the same vibration that was um, that happened after Jesus was crucified or as Jesus died on the cross in the Bible. I think there was like a great tremor. And then uh, the curtain of the temple split from from twain, top to bottom, in twain, <laughs> split in twain. Um, I really just wanted to use that word. Okay, so that's that's what the I think that's what the background is for for this voice being a vibration. Okay, so David will sound a call and he'll be in tune with you if it's right, and then you'll push up like a like a baby out of the woman. Um, and then there's three witnesses like he experienced. Now I think the three witnesses that he experienced were his brothers, but um, he's he's referencing the image here of the uh, oh what is that oh, fancy word for nativity the nativity scene where there's the three um, the three wise men that that come to bear gifts. All right, so all right, so we got a drink. And then from there you go to another scene. Okay, so I think I think that was that was the well, he says there's only two more. Um maybe he's talking about the second one. I don't know. Um but but then um over a period of three and a half years that your your journey will be complete. And then you'll <laughs> He says because I think because he he remained in the world long enough to tell about his his awakening that you'll also remain in this world long enough to tell of your own experience and uh, yeah and then he stresses again you you don't know God until you've experienced it and he's talking about everybody else don't pay attention to them they're theorizing but and he he knows he better than anybody else because he's experienced it or anybody else. Who hasn't experienced um, God? Okay, they don't know. Everyone is punished. Everyone punishes God being punished for this journey. What do I talk about that here? Oh, okay. I go over. I go over that here. Okay, so um, he's talking about the dream here. I think so. Let's. He should punish. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, he's he's just talking about what what other creatures talk about where. Where they, you know, you'll be punished, and you'll be punished. The hellfire and brimstone, brimstone type of message. Um, but but uh, he's saying that everyone punished is God being punished for his dream. So um, he he kind of he kind of uh, deviates, I think, from his previous idea of God being um, or of, of you having like complete responsibility for for what happens. In your life, I mean, it's 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 closely related um, to put this into kind of a picture form. So before it was um, like you have you have a responsibility. you like everything everything depends on what you do in, in your world because of uh, because of the nature of, of consciousness and how that affects everything. Um, he I, I went over the the foundational facts a lot in the in the previous other videos. Um, so this one is this idea is a little bit different because um, he says later on that, that all will be forgiven because um, because it's it's God who is dreaming and God does everything we can't do anything by ourselves. Um, so there's there's a little bit of an idea that's a, a mystery to me, um, but I'll go into that a little bit later. So in case uh, I said we're gonna draw a picture here, so um, well it's. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's been well uh, established. So here, before, kind of you're you're responsible for everything, and then now you're kind of not because God is a uh, stream, and uh, and you you are dreaming as God. All right, many dreams are like nightmares. 
Okay, yeah, it's still still God. God's doing that. God's the only one doing stuff. Okay. Okay, horrible dream. So he's he's supporting his statement of, of God being the one that's dreaming here. I don't think I went over it in the in the PowerPoint. Cool. So um he's using he's using kind of a logic-based argument, I think, here. So let me actually pause the video and and uh, dissect this really quick. Okay, so um, the the basic argument you can read it on your um, uh, whenever whenever he's saying he's saying whenever somebody dreams anything and they say I was dreaming this, um, he's saying that's who like I am like I was that's he's saying that he's God experiencing whatever he's experiencing, um, which I mean if you if you take if you take that tact if you, if you uh, use that um, logic then uh, God, um, man doing anything, not just dreaming, is is God. So anything can be applied to to God doing something, uh, which logically I think uh, meshes with uh, with what he said before, where like up up, up at the at the top of the lecture, uh, at the beginning, uh, he said that awareness is is God. Um, yeah, but I don't understand the uh, the the emphasis of of uh, God being the one who dreams and and us sleeping as well, not not being awakened to to our identity. Okay, all right. So now I go over the definitions that I'm over here. So uh, Jesus is God. And he's a waking God and he calls us brothers. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I was going on with the same same thing that the that the as the, the Galatians thing. <laughs> wow. And so David is called God, my Lord, is the Son of Jesus. It's all it's all here. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, um. All right, next paragraph is here the mystery being is told. Okay, we didn't talk about Elohim yet. Okay, and this this paragraph is just saying the same thing that you said before. Uh, not secular history, divine history. You've got to experience scripture to, to fully understand it. So saying again, he's experiencing it. He's experienced it before. Someone is supposed to live. He knows he's the father. And he's saying the same. He's quoting the same psalm over again. And probably this is because of his subjective experience. He, he feels uh, he's felt. Or he, um, he says it is, it is then that you awake. And it is a feeling, a strange particular awakening that, that takes place in you. So I think he's saying that um, that's because he's experienced this peculiar strange awakening, awakening that, uh, that you'll also experience it. Okay, in the end, everyone awake. All right, so the same thing. Uh, it's a compound unity of Elohim. Um, this is interesting. I like this because of the use, uh, Noble takes that to mean that we are all made up of God. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know uh, why sometimes Elohim was used and why, you know, Jehovah was, I, I don't know the, the etymology or the significance of, um, of those words and, and, and their, their placement. Um, but he's, he's saying here that, uh, that uh, the compound unity of God is, is many, is many in, into one, or at least called into one. Um, Elohim just means uh, like plural, plural gods, I think, right? The supreme one, mighty one. I mean, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not like scholarly enough for this. I can only use use logic, um, which is which is one reason why I'm, this is going to be the last lecture that I'm going to take because I'm just not learned enough to to refute or accept anything that he says. But I can't summarize.
and I can kind of condense it. Um, anyway, okay, so it would be any God. This is regardless, you, you can believe whatever you want. Um, but if you learn, if, if you want it to mean plural, then if it, if it helps you, then by all means, if you want to look into it and uh, make a comment as to you know the real meaning of something, then uh, you please please do that as well. Um, <laughs> I want to say something about what I said about uh, believing whatever is helpful for you, because um, we as humans um, are only capable of understanding a small amount of, of things. We have a limited perception. We're, we're three-dimensional. Um, and uh, so there's, there's things inherently limited to us. Um, and until we as humans are capable of understanding everything and everything being revealed to us, then we have to pick and choose what we believe according to what is most beneficial to each one of us. That's why when, when it comes to stuff like what is the real meaning of Elohim and how that ties into Neville's, uh, Neville's thing and, and the, the viability of, of um, Neville's arguments or, or opinions and how they relate to each other. Um, the, in, in the end, um, subjective truth and what you interpret and believe is true is going to affect you more than what is really out there, what is uh, objective truth. To, to a degree. But it, as far as what we're talking about, metaphysics, um, like worldview, how the, how the world works, how you think the world works and how you act according to that, that is, that is uh, very subjectively oriented. So what you believe subjectively is going to determine how you act and how you think about other people and stuff like that. Oh, that was a very long explanation. This, this, this lecture, I mean, because, because it's not him saying words. It's, or sorry, it's not, it's not him planning out what to say so that it's easily understood. This is transcribed from what he said. So, I mean, you don't, you don't have time to plan out every single word that you say in a, in a lecture. So there's, there's a lot more that can be um, taken from lectures because uh, in, in a book, he would have maybe, uh, when, you, when you say say like a really big idea, um, you can you can really plan out all the paragraphs and all the pages and maybe a chapter that you uh, that you talk about a certain idea with. So, yeah, big big stuff that he covers and he covers like a lot of them, um, you know, one after another. So uh, this is this is really intensive to to go over with any sort of comprehension or uh, with any sort of yeah uh, comprehensively. Okay, so ooh. Um, I'm gonna actually stop it here. <laughs> I'm gonna stop the video here on that, on that shaky, shaky last statement. Um, um, yeah, so in the next one, maybe, yeah, I think four videos will, will cover this lecture. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna stop the video. Bye, see you in either next weekend or in two days based on my video structure, okay.